Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Old News, where the fossils are old, but discoveries are new. My name is Laura Beth. I'm going to be your host. And you can see our uh, expert, Dr. Christian Kammerer, the museum's research curator of paleontology. Hey, Christian. <laughs> um, oh, Christian might be Hello, frozen, Beth. everyone. Good to see you. Oh. Am I? Hey. Am I back? Are we good? You're back. You're back. Oh, We're okay. good. We're good. Actually, that reminds me, everybody. Uh, we do often sometimes have technical difficulties um, with this program. So if you notice any issues with our audio or our video, um, please just kindly type into the chat. Let us know. I'll keep an eye out for that, and then I'll be able to fix any issues. And also, you can type into the chat if you have any questions, and I'll make sure that Christian gets those questions. Um, before Christian dives into our topic for today, I did want to give a big shout out and say happy birthday to Anne, one of our um, old news, hmm, old news fans. I don't know. Super, <laughs> we used to have super a, fans, I'd say. A super fan. <laughs> so thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for being here and happy birthday. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and let Christian take over because I know that this topic is really big. Like it's a big discovery. Oh, that, yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Um, and we're also going to be going very deep. Deep into time. Um, no, no recent stuff here. We're in the hundreds of millions of years. So that means we're going all the way back to the, the Paleozoic era, my, my favorite of the geological eras. So let's pull up uh, our, um, basically our geological column here, our time scale. So, you know, the oldest stuff at the bottom. So on the right there, that's the Paleozoic. And like I said, like Paleozoic is my favorite era, but I think it's the, the least well-known for the general public, like Mesozoic, Age of Dinosaurs, Cenozoic, Age of Mammals. These are fairly familiar to us. Um, Paleozoic, it's just like a lot of weird stuff mostly in the ocean. Um, so there's that alien aspect to it. Um, I think when people do uh, uh, consider the Paleozoic, uh, they're thinking of a few periods in particular. Um, so the first of them, the Cambrian, that's sort of the dawn of animal life. So you may be familiar with the Cambrian explosion. It's when basically almost all of the animal phyla, these you know major groups of animals, uh, all show up in very close succession at the start of of the Cambrian, um, and it's an it's a sea that's full of these these weird wonders, these stem members of some of the modern phyla, like this big predator in the middle, Anomalocaris, and then weird wormy spiny things like Hallucigenia. These are both uh, animals that we've talked about in the past in old news. Um, so really, just this bizarre flowering of of life in the Cambrian seas. Um, and after the Cambrian, I think, you know, if people are thinking about Paleozoic uh, marine life, then they go to the Devonian, which is often called the, the age of fishes. Um, we've talked in the past, you know, fishes are still obviously around today. Uh, you can say that today is still the age of fishes because there are more species of fish than there are of mammals, birds, lizards, any of those things. Um, but in terms of like fishes as kind of the dominant organisms, the only game in town in terms of vertebrates, looking into the Devonian. This is when we have these spectacular giant uh, bony toothed fishes like Dunkelosteus in the middle here and a lot of early sharks, um, just all these, these weird fishes in the ancient seas. Um, of course, you know, even though like fishes are not gone today, uh, in the Devonian, it, these invertebrates from earlier on were also not gone you know they're still invertebrates then they're still invertebrates now and even some of these weird wonders were still around in the devonian so please keep that in mind um in one of our earlier episodes this year on the the morella morphs these weird wonders that it turned out survived into subsequent periods um mentioned that even in the devonian there's still these radiodonts which are, are like anomalocaris there's this one Schinderhannes from the Hunsruck Shale, which is Devonian. So even during the age of fishes, there are these Cambrian style animals still lingering onwards. 
Um, but it is, you know, it, it is a very different ocean, even if some of the Cambrian weirdos are still there, um, because you're going from basically an ocean with no fish to oceans, rivers, lakes that are just teeming, swarming uh, with all sorts of amazing fossil fish. So how do we get from one to the other? Um, well, you've got these intervening two periods, the Ordovician and the Silurian, that I think are not as much on people's radar. And basically what's happening here is, well, there's a lot of things happening there. There's a major mass extinction. There's turnover in all these shelly invertebrate groups like you know corals, brachiopods, crinoids, trilobites. Um, but in terms of vertebrate evolution, sort of bony animal evolution, the major story is the origin and evolution of fishes. Um, so if we look at this Cambrian picture here, there is an early chordate there, this animal, Picaia. So this is a member of the same phylum that we are in, that vertebrates are in. Um, so chordata has both vertebrates in it and then also sea squirts, oddly enough, and then this little group called lancelets that look very similar to what Picaia would have. Um, but this isn't a true, a true fish. I mean, it's not a vertebrate. It's not even sort of closely related. It's not more closely related to fish than it is to, say, a sea squirt. <laughs> Um, so somewhere in between, you have these fish showing up after the Cambrian, but before the Devonian. Um, and so which fish are these? Well, we know the most sort of early diverging. Um, you could also, they're often called primitive, um, these modern jawless fish. Uh, but they're also, they're quite derived in their own way. I, so I think it's maybe a mistake to think of them as primitive. We know that, that the ancestral condition for fish isn't this suction cup, mouth, horrible, flesh sucking, lamprey parasite thing going on. So that's a very derived feature of, of lampreys. Um, that's not the primitive condition. Uh, but these are these are very sort of ancient styles of fish. So lampreys and hagfish, these jawless or agnathan fishes, um, must have evolved back at this time. For, and we know that from molecular data, uh, which shows that they have very ancient lineages. Um, but these animals have very poor fossil records. So these are not bony creatures. Um, they don't even really have uh, vertebrae in a strict sense. Um, so they're not, not really vertebrates, uh, but they are sort of the earliest things that would be considered fish. But because they're soft bodied, we don't really see them in the fossil record. Um, what we do see in the fossil record by the Ordovician and the Silurian are another early chordate group uh, that is related to vertebrates the conodonts, which are known from these isolated sort of tooth elements um, that for many years were mysterious and it wasn't even known that they were vertebrates. Um, and now there's complete specimens that show that they were very, very weird creatures, uh, but clearly something eel-like uh, on the vertebrate lineage um, with these giant eyes and sort of the teeth in this weird grinder uh, inside the mouth. So there are the isolated conodont teeth from early on, um, but very little in the way of like things that we would consider like proper fish uh, until you get this group, the, the osteostrakens. So these are basically things that look kind of like armored tadpoles. Um, you can see the an actual fossil of one of this uh, well-known Ordovician osteostrakin called Sacabombaspis in the upper left. And then in the, the center, what it may have looked like when it was alive. Um, so it may not look like a very impressive fossil. It's kind of like a, a weird potato looking thing. Um, but I assure you for by Ordovician fish standards, that's sort of a spectacularly complete uh, specimen right there and has been, been very informative. Um, so osteostrakens, these are jawless fishes still. Um, so things like Sacrobambaspis and then Ostraspis shown at the bottom. Uh, had these big head shields um, of uh, basically armor and then these more elongate sort of, uh, like I said, tadpole-like tails there. And most of early fish evolution is a variation on this theme of like having this head shield and then this sort of scale male armored tail behind it. Um, so when you go from the Ordovician into the Silurian, um, you're still seeing the vast majority of the diversity is in these armored jawless fishes. 
Um, so this is an illustration of the, the fish assemblage, the different species known from a, a very diverse and fossil rich site in uh, Saarema Island, uh, which is part of Estonia. It's an island in the Baltic Sea uh, that has these wonderful Silurian outcrops there. Um, and you can see almost all of these are Jollus fishes. Uh, but then in the, the upper left, that uh, fish marked 11, that is sort of like drawn in ghostly with a dotted line as if it's not even there. Um, this is an indication that perhaps there is more to Silurian fishes uh, than the fossil record would otherwise indicate. So there are these isolated bits of scale and tooth that have been known from the Silurian for a long time. This one was a taxon called Andrea lepus, um, suggesting that more advanced fishes, jawed fishes, which are the group called nathostomes, uh, may indeed be present uh, in the Silurian. Um, but really for you know, decades and decades now, that's all we really had to go on, were bits of scale, bits of tooth, suggesting that nathostomes were evolving by this time, uh, but nothing really more than that. Um, which is why a, a recent issue uh, of nature uh, was sort of a, you know, an atom bomb to the world of Paleozoic fish evolution. Um, four papers describing actually five new uh, completely unknown species of fossil fish from the early Silurian um, that show that these jawed fishes uh, were diversifying much earlier than previously thought. Um, so here's just you know, a close-up of the art showing showing these new species of fishes. I'm going to get into them in a little, little greater detail. Um, so first, a little bit of background on nathostome evolution, sort of the jawed fishes. Uh, you can see a lot of these divergences happening down, you know, presumed to have happened in the Ordovician and the Silurian, uh, but very little in the way of actual fossil records. So the the part, the bars that are in kind of dark blue there is where we actually know fossils of them. So see that most of them are starting in the, the Devonian. Um, and this is sort of the old story, what was previously known of early fish evolution. So especially you have these, uh, you know, you have cartilaginous fishes, chondrichthians, which is modern sharks, rays, and chimeras, and then the bony fishes, uh, which are lo both lobe fin and ray fin. Um, and so these are all groups that are still around today that we, we know pretty well. Um, but then there are also these supposedly completely extinct groups of fishes, the placoderms and the spiny sharks or acanthodians. And placoderms were thought to be the, the most basal nathostomes, so the, the first to branch off. And then spiny sharks were, for a long time, thought to be sort of just outside of the bony fishes. Um, give you an idea of what these animals look like. So classic acanthodian is this animal Climatius at the top there. So you can see they're called spiny sharks because they have this, this set of spines all down their body and at the base of every one of their fins. So the dorsal fins, the pectoral fins, the anal fins all have these spines on them. Um, they were called spiny sharks, even though you know, they were until recently thought to be uh, relatives of bony fishes, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then there's this group, the placoderms, uh, which do have their jawed animals, um, but they have that archaic sort of armored head shield on this kind of tadpole-like body. So there's a lot of different forms of placoderms. They're very diverse. Everything from these you know, giant uh, super predators like Dinictes there or other, other big arthrodires like Gorgonictes or the really well-known Dunkleosteus. Um, and then these bottom feeding uh, things that would have been most similar probably to some modern catfish, things like Bothria lepus, the antiarchs, um, which also is super diverse, very, very abundant in Devonian uh, fossil assemblages. Um, the relationships of these have always been a little controversial. So I showed the what was kind of the historic uh, topology, sort of the set of relationships in their evolutionary tree or their family tree there. Um, but even by the late 90s, there was some uh, suspicion that this didn't really sort out. Um, so note here, you've got Acanthodians sort of put questionably in between cartilaginous fishes and bony fishes. And basically what this 
illustration is mapping. So the things that are labeled like N3, N1, A1 is just a set of features, just like characters visible in these fossils. And they don't come out cleanly. There's no way really for them to organize these groups relative to one another without having to re-evolve some features or lose features. Um, it's not a very sort of like smooth and straightforward evolutionary progression if all of these are individual groups. Um, and then more recently, uh, this group of uh, what's called the, the maxillate placoderms was discovered, starting with this animal Entelignathus from the late Silurian of China, uh, which really completely overturned these previous notions of early fish evolution. So uh, Entelignathus is you know, clearly a very placoderm-like animal. It has that classic head shield, um, but it has the jaws of a bony fish. And so what this showed is that actually placoderms are not sort of a single extinct group uh, from the Devonian, um, but actually they are the ancestors of all the other fishes. So they're this, what we would call a grade of fishes. Um, and that animals like Entelignathus are actually the common ancestors of all modern jawed fishes, all modern nathostomes. Um, and this has forced uh, paleoichthyologists, people who work on fossil fish, then to reconsider all of their you know, base assumptions about the common ancestor of nathostomes. Um, so one thing that it was assumed for a long time was that, you know, being bony, like a bony fish, like ourselves, because um, we are, we're descendants of bony fish, of lobe fin fish, like that was the derived condition because we're, we're advanced. There's a little bit of that, you know, human centrism there of like, oh, the characters that we have are the more advanced characters. Um, and sharks are more primitive. Sharks are these ancient, you know, living fossil type things unchanged since the Paleozoic uh, in a lot of popular understanding. Um, so their lack of bones and presence only of cartilage uh, has to be the primitive condition. Um, so having a placoderm that looks like a bony fish really turns that on its head. And a lot of work also on these so-called spiny sharks, it actually turns out that that name is more accurate than people thought. So the Acanthodians uh, turn out to be also a grade, not, a, not an extinct group, but the ancestors of cartilaginous fishes. And that sharks and their allies are actually highly derived compared to the, the ancestral character. So their, um, their loss of bone and development of this purely cartilaginous skeleton, that's what's advanced. So having this bony skeleton, bony jaws, uh, and teeth is is actually quite 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 ancient within fishes. Um, so this had already happened several years ago that this you know really rocking the world of fish evolution. Um, but this is still happening in the Devonian and the latest Silurian. Um, and this is where sort of the new discoveries come in. So this is a a new you know as so many of our discoveries that we talk about in old news are are based on uh, uh, Lagerstätten these sites of exceptional fossil preservation. Um, and it's in central China, in uh, Chongqing, um, specifically uh, at the border between Chongqing and Hunan provinces. Um, and this is actually a series of fish and other fossil bearing beds, uh, both from the late Silurian, but most importantly, several very fossiliferous beds from the, the early Silurian. And so just to go through a few of the big discoveries from these, these recent papers, um, we'll start with maybe the, the least visually impressive one, which is uh, called uh, Chianotis uh, duplicis. Um, so this is a, a tooth whorl. So you can see it's uh, each of the different colored things uh, in the figure to the left is, uh, is uh, identical. So it's part of a tooth that's in this uh, larger structure that grows outward and has teeth in the, the lower jaw. So if you've heard of tooth whorls at all in a paleontological context, you probably are most familiar uh, with these, this shark-like animal, uh, Helicoprion, um, wonderful creature from, from the Permian period. Um, it's the buzzsaw shark. I mean, it's, it's close, more closely related to ratfish, but it is, it had a, you know, was filling a shark type niche in the Permian. Um, 
And because of animals like this, which are, you know, bizarre to our modern eyes, uh, I think we often think of tooth whorls as being, uh, you know, unique to something like Helicoprion and its allies. This is another case where sort of, you know, that's our uh, misunderstanding. So tooth whorls are actually quite common in a lot of Paleozoic fishes, even in like things close to our own ancestry. So this is a lobe fin fish uh, called uh, Anacodus. Um, and you can see slightly different type, more fewer and larger teeth in the world. Um, but it turns out tooth whorls are ancestral to both bony fish and uh, cartilaginous fish. And, uh, and Chianotis actually has a tooth whorl uh, indicating that it's probably one of these acanthodians, so these spiny sharks that are ancestral to, to cartilaginous fishes. But regardless, uh, tooth whorls are unique to nathostomes. So this makes it the, the earliest record of a definite nathostome or a jawed vertebrate in the fossil record. Um, and it's, uh, so this is, is probably acanthodian, definitely nathostome. Um, a more definite acanthodian is this animal uh, from, from very similar deposits, uh, Fanjing Shania. So it's also known from a lot of little fragments, um, but put together, they actually show something very, very similar to these classic acanthodians like Climatius. Um, so the, the, the fins, the scales are, are nearly identical to these climated um, acanthodians. And this is important because it's not just a, a vague stem cartilaginous fish. So uh, Chianotis, is, we know it's somewhere on this uh, in the early evolution of chondrichthians, um, but you know it could be be very very early indeed. Um, with Fanjing Shania, um, it is because it's so similar to Climatius. We know it's deeply nested within a radiation of acanthodians. And if we look here, so this is just where Fanjing Shania is in the family tree. Um, its ancient age in the early Silurian pulls all of these other radiations further back in time. So previously, the, these are mostly fish known from the Devonian. And previously, you could say, OK, maybe they all diversified in the end of the Silurian. Um, when you have Fanjing Shania, a very derived acanthodian, already in the early Silurian, that means most of these divergences are actually happening in probably in the late Ordovician. Um, so these groups of cartilaginous fish, bony fish, uh, spiny sharks, placoderms, um, the real sort of, you know, fish explosion, if you're thinking of a sort of a counterpart for vertebrates to the Cambrian explosion, is probably happening much earlier than we expected, and that we actually haven't been looking in the right age for these earliest fish. It's probably happening in the Ordovician rather than the Silurian, and certainly not, not in the Devonian. Basically, everything's already happened in terms of the deep divergences by the Devonian. Um, so this is you know, really forcing us to reconsider a lot of the fundamental assumptions about, about fish evolution. Um, so I mentioned that this was a, uh, a Lagerstätten. Um, and you know, we usually think of in, you know, incredible preservation, you know, Archaeopteryx with all the feathers intact, or like horses with their, their embryos uh, still preserved. And so far, I've shown you just like little scraps um, and, you know, the scraps are important, but there are also, you know, legitimately incredible fossils from, from the new Lagerstätte. Uh, so this is a block of just a ton of complete specimens of, this is one is a placoderm. Um, there's also, it's mixed in with a lot of Eurypterids, these ancient sea scorpions. So this is a whole assemblage of fishes on this one block. Um, and you know all the fishes from this site have turned out to be new species. So this one is was named uh, uh, Shushan Osteus um, after the town uh, Shushan, which is is close to these sites. Um, so this is uh, a placoderm, um, but it shows a weird sort of mixture of characters of the different placoderm groups. Um, it's you know not really readily attributable to any of those like Dunkelosteus or Bothriolepis type groups. Um, and it's probably going to force us to sort of reconsider the relationships between these different placoderms, um, a, a sort of a strange transitional fossil. 
Um, another example of that is this animal called Shenacanthus, which is a, a tiny little fish. So you can see that the fossil um, only, you know, basically a couple centimeters long. So those scale bars at five millimeters. Um, and from the overall morphology, this is clearly a chondrichthian. Like this is something with a very acanthodian-esque body form. Um, but unlike any that has ever been found, it has a it has that head shield. It has that bony capsule around the skull and the anterior body, which is a placoderm character. Um, so this is, you know, if placoderms are the ancestors of all other nathostomes, which now seems pretty clear to be the case, this is something that was, should be expected. At some point you have to have at the very origin of both the bony fish and the cartilaginous fish, um, as they're diverging, you have to have something that looks like a placoderm, um, but you know, none of them has ever been seen. So this is actually a really nice confirmation of that hypothesis. Um, so it's only known from this, this one specimen. Um, hopefully, you know, you know, more will be, will be found, because uh, I think this is going to be really imp another important sort of transitional taxon in helping us understand how cartilaginous fishes went from these actually bony looking ancestors to the sort of shark types that we know today. Um, so for the final group um, and sort of the best preserved of all the specimens, uh, we're going actually back to the jawless fishes. So we've been talking about the earliest nathostomes in the lower Silurian. Um, but this site also has a lot to teach us about agnathan evolution and that its implications then for, for our own uh, origins. Um, so let's talk about a group called the galeaspids. So this is a radiation of uh, jawless fishes, uh, bony jawless fishes, sort of these osteostracans uh, with the head shields um, from uh, mostly from China, but uh, they've been found sort of throughout Asia. And, in mostly the Devonian, some in the late Silurian. Um, so there, if you know galeaspids at all, and these are a very obscure groups, so don't feel bad if you don't. Uh, it's probably because they uh, look alternatively like they're they're constantly happy, or they're constantly shocked. Um, so this is because of this uh, structure, the median dorsal opening on the top of the head shield. Um, this is not actually the mouth. Their mouth is is underneath, uh, like in a, a ray or a skate. So this opening is is not it's not 100% known what it is, but it's thought to have been a both uh, an incurrent flow for the gills. So this is how they suck in water in order to breathe, um, and also olfactory. So for smelling the water. So very similar to what uh, modern hagfish have these living jawless fish what's called the nasopharyngeal duct, where they suck in water to breathe and also to smell the world around them. Um, so galeaspids probably doing something pretty similar. Um, so galeaspids, there are a lot of fossils of them known, um, but historically they were just known from these kind of isolated head shields. Um, and so the new ones uh, from uh, Chongqing are actually uh, beautiful, complete specimens. Um, that give us a huge amount of new information on both galeaspid morphology and about sort of vertebrate evolution in general. Um, so you can see, you know, there's just a, a whole fish here with even all the fin rays still intact. Um, and these belong to, you know, a new taxon uh, called uh, Tugia aspis. Um, and the specimens are so complete that they've enabled basically a, a, a total reconstruction of what the fish would have looked like when it was alive, which you can see in this uh, computer generated rendering here. Um, and what's really interesting about this is that it shows a few things that were actually unexpected for galeaspids. Uh, so it has three distinct dorsal fins, um, but then it has on either side of the body, this ventrolateral fin fold, um, sort of at uh, where you would expect sort of pectoral fins or pelvic fins to be. Um, and this is actually really important because uh, it bears on the question of where vertebrate limbs came from. Um, so of course, you know, we have arms and legs, uh, vertebrates in general. Uh, this group, the tetrapods, to which we belong, are the limbed vertebrates. And we know that these are descended from the lobe fins of fish, uh, like, you know, living lobe fins are the coelacanth and the lungfish. And we have common ancestors going back to the De Devonian that have these precursors of limbs. So things like, you know, Tiktaalik is an ancestor or ancestral form for 
uh, for tetrapods that has has fins, uh, not arms and legs yet. Um, but where do fins come from? I mean, that's the question. It's you know you can go further and further back in time asking where these structures come from. And so the question of where fins originated has been debated for years and years and years among you know ichthyologists, evolutionary biologists, developmental biologists. Um, there were really two major hypotheses. Um, one was the what's called the the finfold hypothesis, which is that you know ancestrally there were these lateral fin folds of just like uniform long fins throughout the body, and then you know over time as these animals evolved, these were separated uh, into the they were sort of discretized into the pectoral fin, the pelvic fin, the anal fin, the dorsal fins, the caudal fin. Um, the alternative hypothesis was the gill arch hypothesis, which is that the these fins are actually derivatives of the posterior parts of the gill skeleton. Um, and these arguments went back and forth for many years, but most recently based on a lot of developmental data so that's looking at embryos, seeing how uh, you know things in sort of in the egg are developing. Uh, the weight of evidence went over to the Gill Arch hypothesis, and most recent papers have sort of accepted the Gill Arch hypothesis. Um, but here we have a uh, early Silurian fish showing what is basically the hypothesized ancestral morphology that the finfold hypothesis always brought to the table. So this is actually confirming one of the key assumptions of the finfold hypothesis. And I think really sort of bringing that back into conversation as you know, serious consideration for where, where fins are coming from, from these ventrolateral fin folds. Um, I don't think this is you know, uh, a slam dunk. Uh, this is, doesn't mean the end of the Gillard hypothesis. Uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of debate moving forward, um, but I think it does you know, just go to show how important the fossil record is for for considering sort of these these big sort of macroevolutionary questions um, and actually finding direct fossil evidence of what we expect ancestors to look like um, rather than sort of existing sheerly in the hypothetical realm. Um, and so, I mean, if you map uh, 2GI aspis uh, representing galeaspids onto sort of the family tree uh, that now exists of fishes where we have sort of these grades of osteostracans and then grades of placoderms and then into the other nathostomes. Um, it does fit pretty well into this idea that you're going from median fins to these paired ventrolateral fins and then getting broken up into pelvic pectoral uh, and then the other fins moving uh, to eventually limbs of vertebrates like ourselves of tetrapods. Um, so it's it's a nice story and we'll see if it if it really you know holds up to further discoveries. Um, and you know, that's really why we we need these completely new uh, assemblages, new ages, because they force us to really reconsider a lot of, you know, we have so many assumptions about how evolution worked, how things happen in deep time, like what should exist when. Um, and the fossil record is often surprising us. And it's telling us that we, you know, it's, it's not always like that. Sometimes you think that these like weird wonders went extinct and they're still hanging around for 100 million years uh, afterwards. Um, sometimes you think that we've got it all figured out. You know, fishes they radiated in the Silurian, and nope, actually turns out that's probably happening in the Ordovician, and we just haven't found the right fossils. Um, I think a lot of the the problem is you know if you look at things like Shenacanthus um, and you know Chianotis. Uh, these are very small fishes. So, you know, these are fossils that are in the millimeter range. Um, and so uh, we've talked before on old news about sort of preservation potential and how smaller things are less likely to preserve as fossils than bigger things generally. Um, so I think we've just been overlooking a lot of early fish evolution because it's happening at, at small size. Um, and I think now that we know uh, from this this Chongqing assemblage, um, basically, and I have a better idea of sort of what to look for and what time we should be looking for. Um, more of these will be found, and eventually, like I guarantee, they'll be finding uh, Ordovician nathostomes. Um, 
hopefully before too long. But I mean, that's, you know, what's exciting about paleontology, like you never know exactly when uh, the big discoveries are going to be made um, in any given sort of subfield, like big discoveries obviously are being made made all the time. Wow, uh, Christian, that was beautiful, like a beautiful <laughs> summary of just a huge, you know, discovery, <laughs> a huge discovery. Thank you. That's all Thank you. Yeah. So um, I have a question then if you were going to, if you were, you know, able to do, or if you were interested in doing research in this field, yeah. uh, you know, what would be your next step after like learning all of these things from these new research papers? You know, what would be the next question you wanted to ask or? Sure. Oh, I mean, that's a, that's <laughs> a huge question. Um, if like, if I was going into like this field, like from the start, let's say like I'm a, a student who wants to get into this topic. Um, I would start out uh, looking at existing collections of Ordovician microfossils and seeing, you know, if there's things that people have overlooked. Like I'm sure museums out there have just like blocks of Ordovician limestone that are just chock-a-block full of fossils. Um, and people never expected there to be vertebrates in there or nathostomes to be in there. So they haven't bothered to go through and like dissolve out uh, potential tooth whorls or fin spines or things from the tons of like brachiopod chunks or sort of trilobite pagidia or whatever is actually in there. Like that would be a very like rel relatively easy first step towards trying to find some of these. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly more like the other thing is to just like look in early Silurian and Ordovician deposits worldwide. But I think before we're like getting to the point of like mounting expeditions to uh, yeah. far-flung locales and spending a lot of money in order to to get field work going on. I'm sure there mm -hmm. are existing museum collections that that can bear on this um, and people just need to have a, a renewed eye. Um, I mean, that's something we've seen with a lot of cases like this, like in my own work in like looking at the Permian and the Triassic. Uh, in the Triassic in particular, there are several groups, um, mostly actually of reptiles, where all it takes is one good skeleton and of a previously unknown group. Um, and then people start going back through museum collections and then it turns out, oh, there's a ton of these things. Like this happened with Silosaurs, which is this group of uh, archosaurs that is either very closely related to dinosaurs or actually could be very early dinosaurs. And you know, the first nearly complete skeleton was found in 2003. And then since, you know, people just finding them everywhere and like, Turns out that fossils have been in collections for decades and decades and decades, wow. just unrecognized. So you really just need that good material, gives you the search image, which lets you then leverage the power of museum collections that already exist. Um, mm -hmm. But then also give you an idea of what to look for when you're going back out in the field. Yeah. Yeah, the importance of museum and, you know, science museum and university research collections right like mm -hmm. yeah so important especially for paleontology well like yeah well anyway. for all all natural sciences but yeah. yes mm -hmm. um so uh christian i have a really important question for you and that is do paleontologists give nicknames typically to any of their like prehistoric creatures because every time I see Dunkelosteus, my mind says, hey, old Dunky. <laughs> and I, it just made me wonder, like, you know, do you do y'all ever uh, do y'all have any fond nicknames for some of uh, your favorite creatures? I, I don't. I do tend to be a bit stuffy in this regard. Um, I don't nickname specimens or organisms. Um, a lot of dinosaurologists nickname specimens like i know this is very common behavior uh when you're digging up dinosaurs we're like you know there's a like famous t-rex named sue um as just probably the best known example but there are lots and lots of individual dinosaur skeletons that have nicknames um as for like whole taxa that's rarer um mm -hmm. I think with Dunkelosteus, one, it's it's an iconic animal. Like it is, it's the best known Devonian, I'd say organism in general, in terms of like public knowledge of it. Um, it is, it's like, it's it's formidable. 
it is, you know, it's bizarre and it does, it has a certain, you know, je ne sais quoi that like <laughs> fits with being called dunk. Like it is, yeah. you know, this is a, a, a rough hewn creature that just kind of that, that harsh monosyllabic name sort of fits it. Um, and I think that's, you know, also very useful. Like I, I said before, I, I, I don't use, you know, nicknames myself, uh, um, but in engaging with the public and trying to raise awareness and appreciation of these creatures, nicknames can be very useful. So like Dunkelostius is, it's a bit of a mouthful as a lot of like the Latin names are, but you know, if you're talking about this big fossil, you know, monstrous extinct fish and it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's just dunk. We love that guy. <laughs> um, it did helps, you know, I think make it more accessible. So yeah, uh, it's from time to time. Yeah. Okay. So maybe don't, you know, for all our viewers out there, I, I'm maybe not a good influence in this regard. So <laughs> No old donkey. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, mean, uh, it's, I think it's on a case by case basis. Yeah, uh, no, I, I was, I was totally kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christian, I have so many questions. All right. Let's see, we might. Okay. So many questions. So you had me wondering. Because we were talking a little bit in the chat about tadpoles and how, you know, mm -hmm. these these animals that you were showing us, especially like the galleas, galleaspids, galleaspids, yeah, galleaspids, how they, you know, they kind of look like have this armored tadpole kind of shape. Mm -hmm. And it just got me wondering about that body shape in general of a tadpole. Like, you know, you think of a typical fish and they're very streamlined, but, you know, then there are some fish that are a little rounder like um you know like a puffer fish yeah sure um and then tadpoles have that kind of body shape and i know all of these are very different animals but mm -hmm. do we do you know is there any benefit to having that kind of body shape so i mean there must a, be some but... yeah it's a very it's a very simple uh sort of swimming shape the tadpole shape it's like very basic it's like that that and the eel like a uh, swimming organism, a swimming vertebrate, um, which is why I think that they have evolved so many different times convergently. Like there's a ton, the things we call eels, there's dozens of different lineages that are eels, like electric eels, true eels, lampreys, hagfish. These are all very distantly related animals that have, you know, all evolved independently towards that eel like morphotype. Because being sort of a long noodly thing that wiggles back and forth is just an easy way to get around in the water. Similarly, like if you don't want to go full eel, having sort of a compact head in which you do head things, usually having to do with feel, feeding, being propelled by a little wiggly tail, which is basically what a tadpole is, is also you know very very simple, very basic, um, but very effective. So unless there's strong selective pressure against one of those morphotypes, you're probably going to end up with something like that. Um, obviously, a lot of fish have entered swimming and flow regimes far beyond that of their ancestors. When you think about like swordfish or thresher sharks or bluefin tuna that are incredibly specialized for hydrodynamic efficiency of like full teardrop shape, incredibly narrow caudal peduncle sort of blade-like tails for really just like shooting through the water at high speeds, um, or alternatively, things like puffer fish or ocean sunfish or um, like trigger fish that are optimized for maneuverability, where the body is very compact. It's not capable of a lot of undulation. That's that wiggly uh, movement. Um, but they use their, their various fins uh, to give them a huge amount of control over the three-dimensional world in which they live. Because you know, being in the ocean, they can go 360 degrees and then also up and up and down. Um, and so, something like the puffer fish, you'll see it does wiggle its body back and forth for the most part. Um, it will stay relatively in place, but it's constantly kind of fluttering its different fins, um, almost like you know, if you're thinking less like a ship or a plane and more like a lot of you know drones that have all these different sets of uh, rotors that keep them in place and give them very high maneuverability. 
Um, so there are all these very advanced things that fishes do. I mean, fishes are so diverse. It's not surprising that they've come up with all these things. Um, but there are also just these very, very basic ways of getting through water. So, uh, and that's what you're seeing in a lot of these ancestral groups. So eel-like, tadpole-like, um, they're just relatively simple approaches, but they work. So they keep being re-evolved. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. And on a similar note, what would be the benefit, do you think, of a cartil cartilaginous skeleton? Um, I mean, there's a, a few things there. Uh, one, you know, bone is heavy. So if mm -hmm. you're a uh, sea creature, um, you don't want to necessarily, I mean, some things are benthic and actually want to be on the bottom of the ocean. But a lot of fish, they don't want to just like sink to the bottom and be stuck in the mud. Um, so if you're actively swimming around in the water, uh, being weighed down by your skeleton uh, can be very maladaptive, can be very bad for your sort of continued survival. Um, so actually you see a tendency towards uh, losing bone in a lot of big bony fish. Like if you look at something like a sturgeon or paddlefish or even something like an ocean sunfish, um, sort of the biggest, heaviest bony fish that are alive today, um, sturgeon and paddlefish are actually, they're bony fish, but their skeletons are mostly cartilage. So they have independently moved towards mostly cartilaginous skeletons. Um, things like the giant mola, these sunfish, if you look at the actual skeleton, it's highly reduced. It's mostly meat in there. And then they have this like incredibly abbreviated backbone. Um, and so in both cases, they are, they are trying to shed as much of that weight from bone as possible so they don't have to you know just essentially be be sunk by their own bodies um so so that's that's one thing um another thing is that there's also just a uh, a lot of energetic costs not to say nothing of weight of actually being able to grow bone so you know if you look at at embryos at least you know there is a lot of these car precursors. Um, and so there's a lot of energetic cost to actually turning that cartilage into bone. Um, and so if you can just forego that and go all cartilage, um, you may have a leg up, especially if you're like a lot of sharks do have, you know, a lot of being an egg sac with lots of yolk um, and just sort of ready rearing to go once you pop out and just start chomping down on things. Um, and don't necessarily have to go through the larval stages uh, that a lot of bony fishes do. Right. Wow. I did not know a lot of that. I learned so much. Um, <laughs> thank glad. you so much. <laughs> well, thank pleasure. you, Christian. Yeah, of course. Um, and thank you, of course, everyone who joined us today. And uh, again, happy birthday, Anne. Um, everyone, we hope that you will join us again next month in November. We will, we don't know yet what the topic is, right? Yeah. We always, well, Christian always chooses it. Um, like within the within the week of uh the program so it's always going to be fresh Better be up to the minute yeah <laughs> all right everyone have a great day thanks again for joining yep <laughs> stay safe out there everybody bye, bye.